My name is uh, John Leo. Uh, I'm actually uh, from up in the Seattle area, but I, I lived in the Bay Area for I think over 12 years total, so it's always nice to be back. And uh, thanks very much for TACT uh, for hosting this. So uh, this, this talk is up on uh, GitHub. If you, if you uh, want to look at the sources are there, the slides are there, and then I also have uh, references. Uh, so uh, pretty much everything I talk about should be, should be referenced uh, in there. All right, so when I first thought about putting together this talk, I was really excited, I had, like all these things I want to say about the pen types, and then I realized you have 50 minutes, you can't really say anything about the pen types. So, <laughs> so I apologize, I, um, it's a little, the talk's a little disjointed. So there's some very basic stuff just to start out, make sure that you know what I'm talking about when I say dependent types. Uh, and then I jump to this big picture, you know, from there, uh, give you an idea of a little bit of where it fits in uh, with, with the rest of functional programming. Um, I'll go into a little bit about dependent types in Haskell, not, not a whole lot. Um, and then uh, show you a bit about the, you know, the, the example I use vectors, uh, how, it, how it works, how you can do it in today's Haskell, and then what it would look like in the future dependent Haskell. So, um, so that even, even this is uh, a, a lot to fit into 50 minutes. And uh, so hopefully, I guess there's no talk after this, we might run a little bit over, but um, so feel free to interrupt, ask questions and so forth. But if the answer is long, I may defer it till later. Um, I will be here both days, so I'm, I'm always happy to, to talk about, you know, dependent type stuff. So uh, feel free to, to hunt me down. Okay, so, so uh, I'm gonna, you know, what are dependent types, just in case, I mean, probably you've heard of them. Um, I, I assume people will have different backgrounds, so I just wanna make sure everyone kind of knows what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna go with the, the classic, you know, basic example that everybody does. So I apologize to the people who have seen it before. Um, so it's, uh, it's uh, vectors of, of length n. Yeah, but it's a, it's a great example. There's a reason everybody does it. It's very concrete. It, it actually shows most of the interesting ideas and, uh, and it's useful as well. And it, there's actually quite a few subtleties. Even, you know, I thought I'd go, go through this example, right? I thought, oh, it's easy stuff. And then I, I realized as I was doing it carefully, there's a lot of little subtleties. So I, I learned something from doing this as well. Um, so, 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 so a vector is, is just a uh, you know, list or whatever that has a fixed length that's actually in the type. And uh, so this is actually you know, a really useful thing to have, right? Kind of the, the, the two classic errors you get with, with uh, you know, traditional programming languages are null pointer exceptions and uh, index out of bounds, right? So Haskell you know, more or less solves your null pointer exceptions, right? Unless you're doing CFFI or something like that. Um, but you, you can get an index out of bounds, right? You have head and tail or partial functions. You can try to index into a list that's, and, and you get a runtime error. So, so not good. Um, and uh, you, can, you can handle this with maybes or whatever, right? But that's doing stuff at runtime. And you, what you'd really like is your type system strong enough that you should be able to catch these things at compile time. So this is one thing that dependent types gives you. All right. So, uh, so I'm going to show you first uh, what these look like in a real dependent type language, which is Agda. Um, so Agda is actually written in Haskell, and the syntax looks a lot like Haskell, which is nice. Um, and it's, I think, you know, it's, it's certainly not a perfect language, but it's, I think, the closest to this ideal, I would say, of, of what a dependent type language should look like. So, so this is going to be kind of our goal, is to see how close we can get to this in Haskell. Okay, so in Agda, there are almost no built-in types whatsoever. You, you build everything yourself uh, using these um, inductively defined types, and so we're going to do that. And this is probably an example you've seen, uh, this first thing you've probably seen in Haskell as well, right? So natural numbers. Uh, Agda kind of encourages you to use Unicode, which I like. Um, one thing to note is, is, you know, Haskell's the only language that got it wrong, right? They, they switched that double and single uh, colon. So Agda, Agda does it the right way. Um, so basically, in natural numbers, you can have zero as a natural number, and then given a natural number, its successor is a natural number. Okay. So that's, and now we'll define uh, vector in terms of this, so that's the, this section. Uh, 
So one thing I should point out is, is Agnikol's type uh, set. Uh, it's based on Martin Love type theory, and he, he called type sets in his, his uh, original papers. Um, but just think of it as type or star or whatever. Um, Agda allows you to distinguish between what are called parameters and indices. So a parameter, which is A in this case, is something that doesn't vary across any of the constructors. So A is the same for both constructors. And the index is something that can vary between constructors. So here we have a constructor with zero, and then we have this constructor with some arbitrary n here. Right, so basically um, what it says is we have the, uh, the empty vector, whatever the nil vector, is a vector of length zero. And then, and this is, uh, maybe I need to explain this as well. This is, is uh, an Im implicit uh, parameter. You, know, you can actually do this in Haskell as well with the new visibility things. Uh, so you can make things visible or invisible. So they're called explicit and explicit in most other languages. Um, so this is something that the type uh, system can actually derive. You don't need to specify it as an argument. So, so what it takes is it takes uh, some element of, of type A and then a vector of length n and gives you a vector of length n plus one, right? So this is cons, all right? And this is, oh, this is mixed fixed notation, which Agda supports. So it means, you know, the left, the left argument goes here and the right argument goes there. And, and it allows, you can do like extra arguments of that as well. So here's an example of what a vector would look like. Um, v, I declare it to be a vector of length two, which you write as sucks x zero. And I put two elements in it, zero and one. And if I tried to put an extra argument in this, you would actually get a type error, a compile time type error. Okay, is everyone okay so far? Um, I have a, I guess I'd say two questions. Sure, sure. First, um, you say this is ideal, but I would rather have a literal two there, not a sucks x zero. Oh, that, okay, so you can you can do that. Uh, you, there's a little thing you can put that connects the um, natural numbers to the built-in thing mm -hmm. of Haskell, and you can write two. Okay. So, but but I didn't do that. You know, part of me that's it's kind of related to that, and that's uh, if you don't know this very well, it's a little confusing to for for somebody who doesn't. You're looking at using nat, I mean uh, n as both a term and a type level. Whereas if you said like the example cons uh, character C and character A, it would be a little clearer probably. Character? Or just something besides your element. Because you're using zero there for the value at the value at the term level, right? But you're also using it at the type level. Oh, oh, so so well, yeah. So you're you're right. No, this so this 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 is dependent types here. So this is not a, a type level thing, right? So you're you're probably thinking of Haskell. Um, this, this is actually a term. So, so the dependent types allow types to depend on terms. So this is a, an honest to goodness term here. I think the point is that you did a vector of maps instead of like a vector of characters. In the bottom example, mm -hmm. the very bottom, mm -hmm. that example, those are values, whereas in the type signature, it's a type. No, this so is actually, this, this is a term still. This is an honest to goodness number. Right, it's not it's not a promoted thing. So yeah, so so this is this is the, the key difference with dependent types is is you have types that depend on terms. All right, so this is an, an actual number there, and whereas this is also a number, right? So yeah, but so excellent questions. That's great because that this is exactly the, the new thing about dependent types. So, so you're saying the new thing in Agda is. If you say rec and two, it knows that compile time that the vector is going to be all times two mm -hmm. lock you. Right? Exactly. So you so you cannot put something of the wrong type of the wrong length. Okay. So yeah, the, the other the second question, yes. Yeah. The other like you because I'm framing this as this is ideal and I'm looking at things okay. that might be mm -hmm. less that sure. maybe less than ideal. Right. I would like to put vec and underscore. Because I have a little, because I'm duplicating effort here. Vec? No, not there. Uh, uh, in the example. In the example? Yeah. So. Uh, oh, you want you want to infer the type? Yes. I want since it, I want to be able to, since I have specifying a literal vector. I don't need to tell it also that it's the same length. Oh, that's, no, that's that's an excellent question as well. So 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 Haskell uses human <coughs> other, which allows you to infer any type, right? You actually give that up independent types. You give that um, up in Agda's implementation of the kind of Well, 
No, I mean, in any, so, so it, it cannot be done in general, right? But, but you, can, you can use heuristics and get close, right? So Haskell has the same problem. Yeah, so Haskell, even with Gaddits, already had to give up mm -hmm. inference, right? But, but that is a very important point. And, and I think, you know, Haskell's, uh, whatever, the, the direction it's going towards is, is, is they want to keep inference, inference as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And certainly Richard, um, in his thesis, goes into, I'm not exactly sure what he can infer and what he can't, but he's trying to infer as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, uh, but, you know, usually even in Haskell, at the top level, you would put the type signature. So it's, it's not, you know, unusual to do that. Um, right. I would say, for example, Idris, which I've also used, I don't know if they've changed it, I used it a while ago, you had to put type signatures on every little thing, and that just got very tedious, whereas Ag is somewhere in between. I thought it was only top level uh, last time. No, even the last I used it, you had to put it in lists and everything, so, but maybe, maybe they fixed that, so. Um, anyway, all right, yeah, very good. Any other things? Okay, so let's, uh, let me make sure I covered everything I wanted. All right, good. All right, so let's look at something we can do with this. Um, so I'm going to define addition, right? This is pretty simple. Uh, zero plus anything is, is anything. Um, and then the successor of M plus N is just successor of M plus N. This is your typical way to inductively define addition. And now we can do a append, right? So if we take, uh, Again, these things are all impl implicit, but if we have a vector of length m and a vector of length n, and we want to get a vector of length m plus n, right? If you start out with nil and add it to something, you get the something, and the other one, if you have a, a cons here, you just cons that onto the append. So this is also exactly the way you define append in, in uh, Haskell, but now you have this type safety that you're guaranteed that when you um, append these two vectors together, their lengths will add up. Yes. Just uh, if you say wrote like a deliberately mis uh, buggy implementation of append, mm -hmm. like um, remove the x prepend from that, would that fail to compile? Yes. I mean, if the lengths didn't match up, it would fail. <clears throat> Absolutely awesome. Yeah. So that's um, okay. All right. <clears throat> so now let's uh, look up things, right? Because that was our goal was uh, to have a uh, type safe lookup. Um, the typical way you do this in dependently typed languages is you define something what's called a finite set, which is thin here. And uh, it's a little bit of a weird thing, but, uh, but the idea is this. Uh, a, a finite set of, of, of size n is, consists of the element 0 up to n minus 1, and then that's it. Right? So what this means then is 0 is a member of fin1, fin2, fin3, and so forth, right? Um, and notice there are no members of fin0 because fin0 is the empty set. So there's no way to say a fin0. And then if you have a member of fin n, you know, say fin1 or something like that, then, um, you know, say 0 is an element of fin1, then you get uh, also an uh, the successor of zero, suck zero, would be a member of fin two, okay? So that, that's finite <laughs> sets, and now given that, we can now do a, uh, a type safe lookup. So what we do is we look up uh, something from fin n, right? The fin n only includes zero to n minus one, so there's no way to look up anything that has n or greater, so it's all safe to, to, uh, to look up something uh, in a vector of length n here. All right, so the way it works, um, Agda works by pattern matching. So we're pattern matching here against this uh, vector. Somehow my thing is not uh, allowing me to select, but it's this vector, sorry, that thing. And um, so in this line, the vector is matched against the empty vector, right? And so if it's the empty vector, we know that the length has to be zero back from where we constructed our vectors, right? That was, uh, sorry, I'm pointing at my screen, that's not gonna help you. Um, that's the, the empty vector is the, is, is the only thing of length zero. And there are no elements of fin n. And sorry, again, it's not letting me select it, but uh, fin n there. So therefore we have this open, on this line, we have this open closed parentheses here. 
Um, so this is the absurd pattern. It says nothing matches, right? So nothing matches and you don't need to give a right hand side because that's an impossible case. Um, on the other hand, if uh, we're over here, if, if we have a, a vector that has a uh, head and a tail, if, if we're trying to look up the zeroth element of it, then that's, um, then we just, we, we know zero is a member of fin suck in, so, so this, this thing is, is occupied, it all works, and we can just give x there. And then similarly, um, in the case suck in, we want to call, we just call lookup on, on the tail of the list, right? So, so this will give us, yes. So one question I have is, mm -hmm. when you say suck n, so let's say n is two. Mm -hmm. So suck n is actually three, right? Because you're saying, so like if I say look up three, it would mm -hmm. actually transfer or translate to look up suck two plus. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and I guess I'm unsure about how Agita can do that. Like, is it, how is it using the definition of suck to transfer that information? Um, well, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's pattern matching. So you, you, when you actually give it, uh, oh, okay. when you give yeah. it, when you give it a three or something that looks like suck, 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 suck zero. Okay. Right. And so it matches the suck and then, and is the, the suck, suck part. Okay. Okay. Why do we need to explicitly cover the absurd case? Um, there's, there's actually, sometimes you need to, sometimes you can leave it out. It's, I, I actually, I, I think I had one example where I needed to one where I needed out. There's, uh, I was actually reading Ulf Norell's thesis. There's, there's something about like empty cases versus empty types or something like that. There's a little bit of a technical decision on distinction, but I haven't worked out the details of that. I mean, if you're interested, we can certainly talk about that afterwards. Um, we'll see in Haskell that we'll just leave out that line. So, okay, so this, one thing I, I wanna note about this lookup though is that um, in the second case, for example, we could have just returned, I, I could have said X here instead of underscore, and, and underscore means wildcard, just like it does in, in Haskell. I could have put X there and I could have returned X both times. So lookup could have always just returned the first element, right? So dependent types does not give you like this guarantee that you're gonna do the right thing. It, it at least gave us some safety, but you, you can still mess up your algorithm. Um, you can, however, make your types even stronger with dependent types. I could have returned not only the element, but a proof that the element was in fact the, the, the nth one that I looked up, right? So, so you, you actually still have some, um, and also you could prove after the fact that it did it as well. Um, so, uh, so it gives you some extra flexibility um, of, of how you want to do things also. Okay. All right, so say you don't like finite sets, which are a little bit weird, and you, want, and you say, okay, I want to just, I want to just give me the, the nth element, right, With, without all this stuff. So you can do that as well. There are usually several ways to do things. So we also have to define uh, Boolean here. Like I said, there's, there's no built-in types, so, um, but it's pretty simple, right? True and false are both Booleans. And then this is a little trickier. We have to define what it means for two things to be equal to each other. So this is what's called <coughs> propositional equality. And uh, I don't want to go too much into the, the details of it. It's, it's a kind of a minefield. But um, basically what it says is if I have two, I give, given some, some set or type, right, A, if I have two, tell, two elements of A, I want to decide when are they equal. And in Agda, the, the, the only way that, that two things are equal is if they're identically equal to each other. So this is reflexivity, written as REPL here. Um, so what does it mean to be identically equal? What it first does actually is it, it runs beta reduction on the, the definitional equality um, until it gets down to a normal form and then it compares normal forms. So we'll, we'll see that in a second. Okay. All right, so that's just some stuff we need as preliminaries. We need one more thing, which is uh, less than, but this is pretty straightforward, right? Um, nothing is less than zero. Zero is less than any positive number, and then if you have two positive numbers, they are um, the relation holds if, if, if and only if it holds on their predecessors. So given this, now we can define a, a new lookup. Um, so this one actually takes a, uh, an actual number, in which I, I called m here, but then you have to give it a proof that m is less than n, right? And then if you've got this proof, then, then you're, you're all okay. You can, you can look it up. So let's see how this works. It's kind of interesting. 
So here in the same case, we had our vector was uh, nil, which means its length was zero. And if we look up here in our proofs, the only case where zero happens for less than is a false case. False can never be equal to true because they're different constructors for rule. So this becomes, this is absurd. Doesn't matter what that is. That's not an allowed case, right? So uh, similar in a way to the finite set case. All right, now let's, let's look at this case, All right? So now vec vector is, is, is some kind of cons, right? And now I've, I've split cases on M. So I said M is zero, right? So now we're up in this case as far as our less than proof goes. And this says it's true, right? So I get true equals true here, which is exactly reflexivity. So that matches there and then I pull out the X. And then for the other case, here now I have suck m down here. This matches this case now, suck m less than suck n. And so, but I was, I was uh, required to pass in some kind of proof here. I mean, it's got to be re reflexivity, but you don't have to know that. Um, and then I just do a recursive call with the same proof. And what's, what's kind of interesting here is this proof was suck m less than suck n is equal to true. This proof is m less than n equal to true, but they're the same proof because like I said, this thing runs this thing down to a, um, a normal form. And so it can reduce the suck m, which it's not letting me select again. It can reduce using that line, the suck m case to the, the n case. Right? So there you get a, a, a type safe look. But this is compile time safety? Yes, this is all happening at compile time. So these reductions are happening at compile time. And, and there's rules that have to happen to make sure that everything is decidable. All your functions have to be total and, and you have you have these unique normal forms. So question. Yes. When you actually call lookup prime, do you have to pass that P explicitly? Um the, the proof? Yeah, yeah, you 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 pass it explicitly. And what would you pass it at when you when you hit the call site? On the, how do you construct that proof when you call it up the first time? You I will. Yeah. Is that your next slide? <laughs> Let's. You, you probably can just. Go I mean, I think no, you, 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 the only proof is REFL. So yeah, you'll you'll pass in REFL. If you in have, fact, when you say REFL, you just say REFL, or would be like. Yeah, you, you just say REFL. Okay. So in fact, I in my Haskell example later when I was I was looking at this on the way up here, I, I actually put in REFL here and here. And I think that may work in Agda too, but I haven't tested it out. So you, you can possibly do that as well. But the question was when call. So if I want to yeah, look up- Yeah, if you do the original step, call, you would, you would pass in REFL. Yeah. Uh, that mean, well, but how would it know that it's correct? So if I have a- It will, it will, it will run beta reduction now. On what, on REFL? On, on uh, oh no, well, wait, wait, what do you pass in? I, I think you, I think you have to have a proof. You you have to pass in m less than. Yeah, I, I think you'll you'll probably do that. No, you're right. You'll you'll have to you you've got to say what. Um, no, I think you may be able to get away with REFL because it already knows what m and n are at that point, right? Uh, so it's oh, going to be able to insert okay. them into the REFL. And so it, okay, since it has what m and n are, it, yeah, it can, it can construct it can pattern match against. Uh, make sure so that if, that you matches. Right. if you have literals, that'll work. If you yeah. have variables, now it's trickier. You yeah. have to provide an explicit proof. Right. So right. you have okay. to propagate the proof all the way up there. Yeah, so this is, you know, this is kind of an annoying thing if you're passing proofs around and you can kind of try to do it implicitly and so forth, but you're right. So, you know, there, there's some extra work to be done here. So I guess my confusion is that like, this is, you're passing in a function and less than equals true, mm -hmm. but you're saying that that gets run at compile time and evaluated. Okay. All right. Okay, so it's a little, yeah, it's a little bit of a weird thing, like, you know, what, what happens at runtime and how do you handle runtime things, and that's something, yeah, maybe we can, we can talk about after the talk, but it's, uh, okay. So anyway, um, all right, so why, you know, why use dependent types, right? So, so one thing is, is hopefully this example is just a very tiny example, but it gives you a little bit of a glimpse of it, is, is they're more expressive than regular types and also more precise. So, 
you know, the usual thing that people say with Haskell is, you know, if it type checks, it works, right? And I can tell you, you know, there, there are plenty of Haskell programs that type check and don't work. So, <laughs> um, so we'd like to have our types, you know, even better, right? So we're really, you know, the goal is if it type checks, it really does work. And you can do that with dependent types. It, it ends up being a lot of work because now you need to do a lot of work at, at, you know, compile time and write these types very carefully. But you can actually, you know, prove that your programs are correct. So, um, at, you know, at compile time. Um, and so this connects in with this propositions as types, which you probably heard of, or Curry Howard correspondence. Uh, so if you want to do kind of full, full blown, you know, higher order logic, you actually need for all and exists, uh, among other things. And uh, so the for all corresponds to these pi types, which are these dependent function types, which I kind of alighted over this, but here's an example, right? This is a term again, M, and this is a type. This is actually a type, um, you know, propositions as types, right? So you can think of types as, you know, propositions, something where you're saying something that depends on that term, right? So, um, so that you write these pi types this way, or this is Agda's way, which I like a little better. Um, this is what's called the dependent function type. And then there's the uh, defendant product type, which is confusingly called sigma, because you think of sums, but it's actually the product, uh, which allows you to do an exist, right? This says there exists, you know, for some x, there's this, this statement b, which is can depend on x. Can I have a question? Yes. Um, when you were, because I thought it was first time with this, mm -hmm. set computer. <clears throat> so uh, I'll do the wrong word there. Oh, I said that at the beginning. I don't know if you, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they, they call it uh, set, set is the word for type. Okay. Um, all right. So, you know, dependent types is a little bit of a buzzword now, but it's actually not new at all. So uh, I, I kind of play around with the history here. So, so blue is uh, theory. Um, brown is uh, functional programming and uh, red is, is dependent types. Um, so interestingly, th these two things go back to the same year. So this is Girard's system F, which is what Haskell's core language is based on. And this is Martin Luff's original type theory paper, which he didn't publish because Girard, the same guy who did system F, found a, a little bit of a flaw in it. He found it was actually inconsistent. So Martin Luff had tried to say that the type of type is type, and that turns out you get an inconsistent logic. And interesting enough, dependent Haskell is going to use type and type. It will use the type of type as type. So you do get an inconsistent logic with, with Haskell as well. But as uh, Richard Eisenberg points out, Haskell already is inconsistent in a bunch of other ways. So you know, why not <laughs> add one more? And it does make things simpler. If you do act in, you, have, you get this hierarchy of sets. Um, so, so uh, Martin Luff corrected that in around 72 and then published in 73, I think. And even he was originally wanted to do like a, you know, this thing as a foundations of math, but, but he, um, he actually was uh, showing people how he could connect it to programming as early as 1979. So, um, so meanwhile, you had uh, Milner, uh, you know, of course, who did the Hindley Milner uh, um, type system which is a sort of restricted system F, which is what Haskell itself is, is uh, the surface language is based on. So Milner was doing this uh, theorem prover LCF, and then he did the meta language for it was ML, which is of course one of the, the key predecessors to, to Haskell. And so these are actually kind of connected together, but somehow these two worlds diverge, right? People see, seem to think, okay, well, dependent types are for proving things, functional, you know, standard ML style things are for doing functional programming. And it's, it's only, you know, I think um, Cayenne was, was maybe one of the earliest ones where someone thought, okay, well, maybe I can actually use dependent types to do uh, programming. But still, you know, even with Haskell, if you look at the Haskell Gadget paper, it references dependent type paper. So they certainly knew about it, but they decided not to do full dependent types, you know, at that time. So, um, so it's kind of interesting. I think we're finally seeing a, you know, a little bit of a convergence of these two worlds uh, recently. Um, so, uh, all right, so, anyway, so there's a lot of, you know, very cool work that's been done over the past few decades, but, but I would like to argue that the golden age for functional programming and type theory is actually right now. I mean, it's, this is 
just such a really exciting time. So finally, you know, we're seeing, you know, here at TACT and other places, right, we're seeing uh, functional programming be used seriously in industry. Um, so big data is certainly one of the, the drivers for it. And my, my experience is, is from that area. Um, finance and security, you know, most, I, I, I think still correctness in the computer industry is not taken seriously, but um, <laughs> finance and, and security are kind of areas where I think people are finally getting serious about it. And so this is where, you, you know, strong types can really help you. Um, so certainly in the academic world, there's some, you know, big things happening. So CompCert, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's a, uh, you know, prov provably correct C compiler um, written in COC. Uh, DeepSpec, which is also using COC, which COC is kind of, I skipped over it here, but it's kind of the, you know, it actually predates Haskell a little bit. It is, is the um, kind of oldest and, and most robust now uh, dependently typed language. Um, and it's being used for all the, the serious work right now. So DeepSpec is uh, a five-year uh, NSF project that's being done between uh, several East Coast schools. And uh, the goal is, is very ambitious, is to prove, you know, have a provably correct uh, tool chain that goes from the uh, hardware level all the way up to operating systems, compilers, and, and you know, maybe even application software. Um, and I was actually, I went to the first deep spec conference or workshop and it was clear that this is, at this point is, is actually just an engineering problem, right? It's a lot of work, get a bunch of grads, you know, grad students and get them to crank this out. And, uh, you know, obviously I think there's a lot of theoretical work that needs to be done, especially because it's a lot of tedious hard work and you'd like to make that easier, but it, it really can be done at this point. So, so that's very exciting. And then uh, on the other, um, and uh, I'm, I'm also a, a pure mathematician. I'm very excited about this stuff. Um, there's work being done to actually verify mathematics mechanically as well. So the first, you know, actually the four color theorem was, was the first big computer proof back in the 70s, but people didn't believe it, right? Because it was written in, in IBM 360 assembly language and, you know, who, and in fact there were bugs in, in, in the, the program. Um, but more recently, this was actually, you know, redone where not only the, the computer part of the proof, but the hand part of the proof were all redone in cock and proven uh, mechanically. And then a, a much bigger thing was the, the fight Thompson odd order theorem, which is kind of the linchpin of the classification of finite simple groups. The, the, I think the fight Thompson theorem was, I forget, somewhere 200, 500 pages alone. And then the whole classification is like 10,000 pages plus. Um, but they at least proved that part was true. And then there's more stuff happening. There's actually a big proof uh, conference happening in Cambridge, I think sometime this year. So a lot more work going on in that area. Another thing which I only discovered recently, but this is actually goes back about 20 years is using dependent types to do a computational semantic. So this is, this is very exciting as well as a, a complement to the other approaches being done for, for NLP. And then there's still a lot of interesting theoretical work being done. You've probably heard of homotopy type theory. More recently, there's cubicle type theory, which is a, a sort of computational realization of hot. And then there's still a lot of research being done on, on the connections between category theory and functional programming and so forth. So, um, so kind of, you know, it seems it takes about 25 years from, from ideas to make it from academia into industry. And so, so my thought is, well, let's look at the stuff being done in academia now and you can see what it's gonna be like 25 years in the future, right? You can look at that. But then on the other hand, I don't wanna wait, right? So I, I'd like to push things along uh, you know, as much as I can. So where is this all headed? Um, so this is my favorite quote by Robert Harper. I'll just read it out. So eventually all the arbitrary programming languages are going to be just swept away with the oceans and we will have the permanence of constructive intuitionist type theory as a master theory of computation. Without a doubt in my mind, no question. <laughs> so from my point of view, this is a personal statement working in anything else. <laughs> so I've, I've told a lot of colleagues about this and their response has, has ranged from disbelief to disinterest. But uh, I personally love this quote. And, and it, I mean, I'm, I'm both a mathematician and computer scientist, and I really 
I'd love to see the two merge, you know, in, into one. And I, I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. But again, <laughs> what year did he say that? He, when did he say that? Um, it was a few years ago. I, I forget. I've, it's, it's in the, the references. Um, I, I'm sure he still believes it. And I'm sure he <laughs> believed it before that. So, um, but, uh, but anyway, this is, I think this is the goal. And I, I do think, you know, the ideas in Haskell now and dependent types and so forth, this is all kind of heading there. So, so, so it's an uh, exciting time. Okay, so now finally, dependent types in Haskell. This is the title of Richard Eisenberg's thesis. And I mean, if anything, my goal, I can't really say much about the thesis, right? I have very little time, but um, my goal for this, this talk is to get you to read the thesis. It's actually, it's really well written. Uh, written. Um, it's very clear. It's, there's two very technical chapters, which are five and six. But the other chapters are very readable, and they'll give you a much better introduction than I, I can in this talk. So um, just to give you kind of an outline, uh, preliminaries basically just goes over the current Haskell extensions, which are useful for dependent types. Uh, he then, uh, motivation is a bunch of examples. He starts with length n vectors, of course, but he goes into you know, far richer and more interesting examples. Another uh, one of my favorites is uh, uh, type safe uh, schemas for, for SQL. Um, Pardon me? When he, in the motivation section, mm -hmm. does he give the examples in his uh, implementation for the? He, yes, I believe, well, he has, he has kind of, let, let's see, it's like multiple colors. So he has like a yellow, which means you can kind of, kind of do it now, and then a red, which means you can't quite do it yet. So he, he kind of grades it and shows you know how much you can get away with and what you need. Right, but it isn't pseudo code. It's something you can run, uh, except for the ones. You can except run. for the red ones, yes. Okay. The the other stuff you can run, and even some of the red ones you can fake with singletons. So yeah, um, yeah, very good. Um, so he then goes into kind of just an overview of dependent Pascal, and this is still fairly high level and, and quite readable. Um, he goes into PICO, so um, dependent Haskell will require replacing um, core, the core language with a dependently typed core language. So, that, so this is his uh, proposal for that, which is called PICO. There's actually even a more recent proposal that was just submitted to ICFP um, by Stephanie Weirich, which may be another, another possibility. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, and then as we were talking about before, type inference is very important, so he actually gives a, a type um, inference uh, algorithm, um, or you know, as, as much as, as possible. I haven't read that uh, section carefully. It's, it's very technical. Um, and then he goes over kind of what's going to be required for the implementation. And there's a few technical details here, but this is also pretty high level and, and uh, well worth reading. And then finally, um, he talks about related work, which is languages like Agda, Idris, and so forth. Um, and how they connect, how they relate to uh, dependent Haskell, and also um, future future work um, that can be done. So anyway, great great thesis. I, I highly re recommend taking a look. And then, as far as the timeline goes, he had um, I think this is still the most recent post on his blog. Um, uh, probably you know 2019 to 2020 looks uh, looks like realistic. So still quite a ways away. Um, I personally am, am fixing bugs in the type checker now so I can get to the point where I can help him out. But uh, I think it's, it's going to be a lot of work. So, uh, um, but something to look forward to. And if, if you're interested in, in helping out, I'm sure he would, he would love getting it, even more help. Is it engineering work or theoretical work that needs to be done? Um, mostly the latter. I think there's probably, you know, the, the theoretical work is almost all been done in the thesis, but I'm sure there are little things that probably still can be improved or be worked out. But if you're interested in the theoretical work, you know, definitely talk with them. Um, but yeah, I think at this point, you know, he knows pretty much what has to be done. It's just a matter of, of getting it in and of course making it work with all the other stuff that's going in. And you know, now we have linear types going in and, and A4 and stuff. So it's 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 crazy, right? Okay, so let me let me show you with my you know again very simple examples um, what you can do now and and what we can look forward to. Um, and like I said, this is you know it's almost too trivial, so I apologize, but but I think it's still maybe interesting in a way. So first, I, I got away with 
just these uh, extensions, and some of them were a little gratuitous. So I, I like Unicode, so I put a Unicode syntax. I want to put in explicit for all, which I think makes things a little clearer, especially as your types get more complicated. Uh, Gadgets, you absolutely need type families for sure. Type operators, you know, to make things look nice again, I think it's a good idea. And then I put in type and type. Um, I only needed this in one place, but uh, this also pulls in uh, data kinds and poly kinds, which are needed. But I put in type and type because I want to show you, you know, what, what fails as well, right? So this is kind of type and type gives you, you know, as, as much as you get for now. So the way I've done this is I put the, the Haskell above and then the Agda below so you can compare the two. So we can define uh, NATS. Uh, you know, it's a little different. Use capitals, capitals here. Uh, but otherwise, uh, looks looks pretty similar, right? And then, of course, type instead of set. All right, and then vectors. I don't think we can do these these pretty uh, things we did down here, but uh, this is at least I think the notation he uses in his thesis. Um, so we have our, our nil and our cons case. So what's interesting here is, is we're using the data kinds, right? So if you, if you know the data kinds thing, it, it, what it does is it promotes what, what happened behind the scenes here is that nat got promoted to a kind called nat and zero and suck, um, we added, so this is in addition to the, the nat that's the, the type, um, it got promoted to a kind and zero and suck got um, promoted to uh, types. Okay, that have kind nat. Uh, so you can, because there's a separate um, term and uh, type namespaces, uh, you, you can actually get into trouble, right? And, uh, often you'll define data, you could you know, define data k equals k something, right? You can use the same name for the type constructor and the uh, data constructor. So to disambiguate those in the case that you promoted something, you put a little tick in front of a promoted uh, data constructor. And in this case, it's not needed because I didn't have a type name zero, but, but I'll stick it in anyway because it also helps you keep straight what's what. Um, so this, this nat is now the, the kind nat that got promoted, and this zero is the um, type zero that got promoted up from the constructor, right? So, um, but in any case, uh, we can do this and it looks, you know, reasonably like the, the Agda version. All right. All right, so pluses, we have to go to type families. That's the way to do type level functions in Haskell. Um, they're not quite FERC's class. It's, it's a little annoying, but, but we can still do it. So, and it, we can even do it, um, you know, as an, an infix operator with these type operators. So again, looks, looks pretty similar. Um, okay, everyone okay with that? All right, and then append also looks uh, pretty good, right? We actually got our M and our N and our M plus N here, and this will also um, fail at compile time, uh, just if you, if you uh, do the wrong thing. So it looks, uh, looks good so far, and also finite sets we can do. Uh, again, they look very similar to the, uh, the Agda. And finally, we can do lookup. And, all right, again, pretty, pretty similar. And this will, again, you notice I, I did leave out this, this clause in the Haskell case. There's no way to write absurd, but it, it works fine. I, I'm pretty sure I ran this. I tried to run it with the warning, you know, warning to say if, if you um, didn't cover all the patterns, and I believe it passed the warning, so. Everything looks good. So look at that. Look, we can do dependent types in Haskell right now, right? What, what's, the, what's the big deal? We got everything we need. Okay, well, you can actually do some stuff. I mean, it's, it's absolutely true. This is all completely legitimate. Um, and the key, the key thing is that uh, in, in Haskell, you can have types depend on types. That's okay. You can't have them depend on terms, but you can have them depend on types. But now let's try to do lookup prime, and where we actually did have a real type depending on a, on a term and, and see what happens. So we'll define uh, um, propositional equality, and it looks, again, uh, I think that's the same. And we have to use type family for less than, but fine, get that to work. 
All right, so now let's try to do our lookup. You can see I call it lookup bad because it didn't work. And what happened, right? So here I have my, my M. Um, and then I tried to use it in the M less than M greater than true, right? This, this got promoted up to a, uh, a type, but its kind is nat, right? So this, this ends up being a problem because our function type in Haskell is not the dependent function type. If you look at the kind of it, it only takes type to type to type. It will not do anything else. So this, this little hackery of promoting something up to another kind does not fool it. Um, so, so we're kind of stuck here, unfortunately. So why did, why did fin work? Well, fin worked because we embedded our NAT into a type, right? And so that, that's, what we, what, that's what we have to do to make things work again. And, but we don't want, fin, fin is too imprecise, right? Fin gave us all the numbers between zero and uh, n minus one. We want exactly the number n if we're gonna reference that. And so singletons to the rescue, right? This is exactly what singletons are for. Um, so what a singleton does is it, it's going to embed our NAT into a type, um, but it's going to embed it in this one-to-one -one way where we have exactly one NAT per type, right? And you've got to make sure to get this right. If you screw it up, you know, your proofs are going to be wrong. So, so singletons are a little dangerous. You got to, you know, no, no one prevents you from mis, mis doing your singletons, but, but Richard does have this, uh, you know, singletons, uh, package, which does things automatically for you. We'll promote things for you. We'll promote functions to type families and so forth. So it, it takes away, uh, you know, a lot of the places things can go wrong in the boilerplate and so forth. But, but this, is, this is how you have to do it right now. So what we do is um, we create this S0, which is the singleton that, that holds exactly the type zero. And then, uh, you know, exactly the same kind of inductive pattern if you've got a uh, S nat n, you get an S nat second. So it structurally looks exactly like the natural numbers, and so we can use them just like we use the natural numbers. Now everything, now everything works, but uh, we had to use the singleton uh, numbers here instead of the original numbers. Any camera the right functions over that? Over over your S well, nats. Uh, I mean, you should be able to write type families. So. Right. Yeah, but, but you know, yeah, so they're not quite, you know, your, your regular first class functions, so. Okay, so. All right. Oh, wait, oh, did I, I skipped a slide. Oh, yeah, sorry, I meant to do, I meant to, let me go back for a second. Um, I actually, I did several attempts at, uh, at getting this, uh, look up to work without having to use singletons. And I think there, you can look at them in the code that I have online, but this is actually one that's worth interesting. So it's like, well, if we can't put terms into types, but on the other hand, we can, types can depend on types. So why don't we just push everything up a level, right? So this is what I did. I, instead of look up being a function, I made it a type family. So now everything's at the type level. Um, Right, so now M is, M is a, uh, a type here instead of a term, and I can now embed it in, and actually this, this thing uh, uh, type checks perfectly, no errors, but, th but this has a problem. Anyone see what it is? Can't use it. <laughs> you can't use it, exactly. You can't, you can't actually run this thing. This is only at the, the type time. Actually, you can kind of run it. There's something called kind bang, um, that will try to evaluate a type into a normal form. However, it only does small step semantics. I tried it out. So it only does one step at a time. And then you can't assign it to anything to do the next step. So you'd have to like copy paste it and, and you know, do it in your, uh, in GHCI to get it down to the normal form. So it's, yeah, so you, you, you know, you can't, you can't do anything with it. It's exactly right. So, okay. So let's, uh, sorry, I missed that. Let's move back. Um, all right, so this, this all works, but now you have singletons everywhere, right? So it's a big, a big mess, and we'd like to get rid of singletons. And in fact, Richard said uh, his goal for dependent types is to completely obsolete the singletons package, right? So it should be gone. 
And in fact, even more, I mean, uh, data kinds, no more need for data kinds. You don't need promotion anymore. So, so let's see how it's going to look. And this is not code that you can run now, but uh, at least the middle part. So now I have three sections. The first one is the uh, thing that works now. The second one is how things are going to look in dependent Haskell. And then we've got the idea at the bottom again. So now instead of a type family, we don't need, also no need for, for closed type families. You can do everything with, with regular first class functions now. Awesome. So we can define a, a plus here. In fact, it should even work with the, the type classes. Um, if we want to add nat to a, a, you know, num or whatever. Um, so this is just a regular term level nat function. So now it looks, you know, pretty much exactly like the Agda version. Okay, this is like a, a where's Waldo thing. What's different between these first two sections? Anybody see it? You have a tick. There's a tick here, right? So what's going on here? So these look almost the same, but they're very, very different under the hood. So here we're using data kinds to promote everything up. Here, these are honest to goodness, just like a dependently typed language should be. These are honest to goodness terms, nats. So no promotion happening anymore. Unfortunately, we have this namespace problem though, because this is the term level plus, and we got to use it at the type level. So you got to put a tick to say, oh, I'm using a term level function at the type level. Um, I did ask Richard about this, and he said nothing's set in stone yet. You know, they, I, I think it might be worthwhile trying to find an alternative to having put ticks everywhere, right? Could we unify the two namespaces? I mean, it's going to like break all this code, but I don't know. Is it worth it? It might be. GHC nine. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? GHC nine. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. So uh, I, I'm sure there's gonna be a major uh, uh, version tick when, when this goes in. So, okay, so, but anyway, that's, that's you know, they look very similar, um, uh, but, but under the hood, like I said, very different. And now uh, look up prime, everything's uh, beautiful again. Uh, we don't have our singletons. Uh, and uh, the big difference here though, something new, we have a pie type. So this is distinct from the for all type. Um, in this one, the uh, term information's erased. In this one, you keep it around. So you can actually use it in your, your later types. So this is, this is maintained at runtime. And a distinction that dependent Haskell has versus the other ones is you actually get to pick, you know, what do you want to preserve at runtime and be a true pie type? What do you want to throw away? So, uh, so that's one of the design. Interesting has a ratio annotation as well. Yeah, oh, Agda does as well. Um, you can say irrelevance and stuff like that. But this one, it's, I think, a little, uh, I, I don't know. I, I forget the address one, but it's, 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 it's quite clean in this one. So, OK, so that's, uh, let's uh, make sure I didn't miss anything. All right, so that's it. Like I said, just a very, very tiny piece. Um, look at his thesis to, to find out uh, you know, a lot more. And then uh, I encourage you, if you haven't already, to try playing with the uh, Cocker Agda. They're a lot of fun. Uh, try proving some things. Also, Idris uh, 1.0 just came out April Fool's Day. And there's a, a great book by Edmund Brady uh, um, introducing that. And that's more geared at, at actually programming versus uh, proving. So uh, question. All right, yes. Just to, uh, so I understand the timeline, if you use singletons now, you can get a lot of work done. Exactly. And, but hopefully that will all disappear and make it even easier for these singletons. Yeah, so see, you can still, right that, that is still, yeah, you're, you're, you're the best way to go. Absolutely. Yes? Or maybe can you come over to the door? <laughs> How does dependent Haskell and like linear types, are they inconsistent with each other? Like, no, they should be, they should be. I mean, as far as I know, I don't know if people have thought it through, but it should be consistent. I mean, yeah, they should be, there's two different extensions to the, to the type system. I was just, just wondering if you turn them on at the same time. The specific implementation of linear types they took was based on a, a, a linear type that's compatible with dependent types. Oh, okay. so, so they already thought that through. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So, all right, yeah. All right, any other questions then? Oh, yes. Yeah, so if I have a vector of length m plus n mm -hmm. and one of n length n plus n, where I just did the addition in a different mm -hmm. order, are they going to be really equal or do I have to put some equal? You, you, you gotta prove those things are equal. Even even n plus m and n plus n, you have to 
prove them equal. So they're not definitionally equal, they're propositionally equal. So you actually have to run through a proof and yeah, there's, there's some tedium there that uh, uh, has to be done. So there's, there's, uh, there's yeah, well, yeah, we can talk more about it. It's kind of a, it's a big topic, so. <laughs> All right. All right, yeah, thanks very much then.